We're going to continue tonight in our series on centrality, as Pastor Chad uh, kind of started, actually Pastor Mike started us in this message, looking at the person of Yeshua throughout the context of the Bible and his role and seeing parallels. And tonight we're going to continue to look at that, um, and we're going to look at two people specifically. We're going to look at the person of Isaac, and we're going to look at some things in relation to Yeshua and his life, and specifically in a story that comes to us from Genesis chapter 22. So if you have your Bible tonight, or if you have a device with your Bible app on it, if you want to open up with me to Genesis chapter 22, and that's where we're going to begin tonight. So Genesis chapter 22, we're going to begin in verse 1 and go through 19. We'll just read the text, and then we'll come back and walk through it a little bit together. So here's what it says in chapter 22 of Genesis. After these things... God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split the wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and the boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the sacrificial knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, my father. And he replied, here I am, my son. And Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered him, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. And when they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac. He placed him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he replied, here I am. That's a common reply for Abraham. And then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham named that place the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, this is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the gates of their enemies and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. And it finishes with, Abraham went back to his young man, and they got up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham settled in Beersheba. Father, tonight we thank you for your word. We thank you that preserved in these stories and these accounts is such a rich story, a rich truth that we can engage in, that we can learn more about you. We can learn more about your son, And ultimately, we can learn more even about ourselves through these stories. And tonight, as as we deliver this word, God, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would use me as your vessel to help us enlighten our eyes to these truths, enlighten us tonight to hear from you. And we ask it in the mighty name of Yeshua. We say amen. Amen. So, we'll begin from the beginning. So, Abraham gets up early in the morning. As I was looking at this text, I wondered, you know, why did he get up early in the morning? And I just thought to myself, well, probably he was trying to avoid the questions from his wife that would inevitably come, where are you going with our son? But we know that he gets up early, he prepares the wood, and he takes two of his young men, and they leave. But back in verse 2, the call from God says, take your son, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So first off, we know one thing. He says, take your son, your only son. Well, Abraham had two sons, right? So why 
Why the distinction? And as I was looking at this, there's a rabbinic story that, that goes like this, that, that talks about this discussion and kind of puts the narrative in this way. It says, the rabbis say of the story of Abraham's response to God's call to take his only son, that Abraham says, he, God tells him, take your son, your only son, and God says, but I have two sons. And God says, you're only one. And Abraham says, but I have, but each is the only son of his mother. So God says, well, then, to the one whom you love. And of course, Abraham says, but I love both. And finally, God says, okay, Isaac. And he, he reveals it to him. But the reality is the reason why God defines Isaac as the only son in this context is because Isaac was the only son of promise. Okay? Ishmael was not the son of promise because God had promised Abraham and his wife a son in a specific way, and that was Isaac. So this is the son why God makes specific. He's dealing with the son of promise. And in Genesis 12, if we back up a little bit, we see when God calls Abraham to leave his country and his kinsmen. In, verse 12, or in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. This is before Abraham even leaves his people. He promises that he will make him a great nation and a great people, and that he will be a blessing. Then we go on into time, into Genesis chapter 15, and when God is confirming his covenant with Abraham, in Genesis chapter 15, it says this, after these events... The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me? Since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now, Abram, at this point, is looking at this purely through physical eyes. He's like, what can you give me? I don't, even if you gave me the world's wealth and everything that I could want, it doesn't matter because when I die, it's, it's not going to continue in my family. It's going to go to, to a slave in my own household or, or an heir far off. And what's interesting to this, and I think part of the heart of Abram in this time, is he realizes in this culture, if there is no heir, what will happen to his wife? What will happen to his wife? Because with no heir, if Abraham passes first, his, whatever he's collected will go to a person that is not necessarily his direct family who can completely take advantage and completely just cast Sarai off to the side and not care for her. So I think part of this in him is, is concern for his, his own wife's sake and his own family. God, what could you give me? Because even if you gave me all these wonderful things, I'm not going to be able to do anything with them. But then he continues in verse 4 of chapter 15. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. Okay. Well, okay, God. He took him outside and he said, look at the sky and count the stars. If you are able to count them, and then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. And it finishes in verse 6 of chapter 15, and Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So in this place, God's confirming his covenant, and Abraham, okay, God, I believe you. You're going to give me an heir, and it'll be from my flesh. Okay? That's what it, what's, it'll be from my flesh. Okay. And my offspring will be as numerous as the stars. The issue is it didn't happen quickly. Anybody been in that place in your life where you feel like God has given you something, <laughs> promised you something, and it just seems like endless waiting? Years go by. Years, years, years go by. It doesn't happen quickly. And then in Genesis chapter 16 and verse 2, the story picks up here. Sarai said to Abraham, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave, perhaps through her I can build a family or I shall obtain children. It reads literally. So you see in this, even in Sarai, her desire is to preserve her family heritage. And so she says, I'm going to take this. Pastor Mike said it very well tonight as we were finishing worship. How often is it that we want to take matters into our own hands? 
and we want to just say, okay, God, this isn't happening quick enough. I'm going to take, take a little bit of initiative here. And she goes off, and she asks Abraham, why don't you take my, my maidservant, my, my slave, and through her, maybe we can have children. So he does. He takes Hagar, and as you know the story, they give birth to, to Ishmael. It's okay for a little while, but then there's tension. Why? Because... Sarai is very, very, now very much afraid of the thing that she took the initiative for. She's afraid that actually now this child and her mother is going to usurp her place in the family lineage. So in essence, she created her own problem, right? So she's, she's created her own problem, and she takes it, she had taken upon herself. But God is faithful, and God eventually does fulfill his promise to give them a son, to give them Isaac. But it took a long time. It took years. And when we come back to our story in, verse, in chapter 22 of Genesis, it's almost as if when God says, take your son, that son of promise, and I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice, but God, what about all those years of waiting for this promise? Now you're just asking me to throw it out the door? Goodbye, it doesn't mean anything? What is this about? How, how could that? You can see how that would be the human response to this question. How can this be? Questions, why God? Why, why is this the way you want things? Let's go back to our story there in Genesis 22. We know that it took three days journey for, journey for Abraham and Isaac and the two young men that went with them to get to the place that God said he would show them, the land of Moriah. And when they arrive there, Abraham says to the young man, stay here with the donkey, the boy, and I will go over there to worship you, then we'll come back to you. It's amazing to me that as we're going to kind of come through the story, we'll see, but even here, Abraham is kind of showing faith that he doesn't say, I'll come back to you. He doesn't say, we're going to go over there and worship, because he, he, he knows what he's supposed to do. He's not dumb to, to what, what's happening here. But he, even here he says, in faith, we'll come back to you when we finish worshiping. Now, I want to just spend a moment and talk a little bit about this place. This place that God said, the land of Moriah, it's only mentioned, Moriah is only mentioned twice, that word in the Bible. It's mentioned here in Genesis, and it's also mentioned in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. It's identified as the place or the mountain, Mount Moriah, the mountain where Solomon built the temple of the Lord. That's the only two references we see of this area in Scripture. And it's interesting to me. I mean, we could, there's, I looked at this. There's a lot of discussion. This, was this really Mount Moriah? Was this really Jerusalem? Did he go? We know it's three days journey, okay? So let's just, let's just make two assumptions. Abraham was in Beersheba. If you go three days to the west, you end up in the sea. <laughs> if you go three days to the east, you're going to end up at some point in the Dead Sea. So the only two options are north and south, right? That's really the only two options. If you go south, if it's anything like it is today in terrain, you're going out into the desert wilderness. Now, it could have been something completely different, but that's the direction you're heading. If he comes north, he ends up around this place, Jerusalem. And most scholars and most people believe that it, it, it was, that the, the canon of Scripture, it, it leads us and it makes a connection and it leads us that it was indeed Jerusalem Abraham comes to with Isaac. And what's interesting is he didn't just show up at this place. If you look at the archaeological evidence, Jerusalem actually at that time was probably inhabited. It says that there were um, early evidence of settlements established near the spring of Gihon between 45 and 3500 BCE. So people would have already been living around this spring, which sits just south of this mountain. So he didn't wander out into the middle of nowhere where there was nobody. There was probably people here. And I think when he sent the two boys away, he probably sent them off to water the animal while he was gone. So it's, it's interesting to see this connection, but God tells him to go to a specific place. And he brings him to this mountain where he's going to fulfill this call to sacrifice his son. Now, continuing our story in verse 6 of 22, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And in his hand, he took the fire and the sacrificial knife, and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke up to his father Abraham and said, My father, 
And he replied, here I am, my son. And Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Okay, where is the lamb? And Abraham answers, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And then the two of them walked on together. Here we see the first glimpse of the the messianic, the Messiah in this passage. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. John the Baptist in his testimony about Yeshua, it's recorded in the Gospel of John in verse 129. It says, the next day John saw Yeshua coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isaiah 53, the prophet Isaiah in 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 chapter 53 verse 7 says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he didn't shearers, he did not open his mouth. And finally, in Revelation 13, verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In three different places in scripture, we see Yeshua identified as the lamb, but I think we see him first identified by Abraham as God himself will provide the lamb. Amazing that we see him. What this tells us is that just like Isaac, Yeshua was a son of promise. Isaac was a son of promise, given by God. Yeshua, the lamb to be slain, was a son of promise, just the same way. John 3.16, you know this passage. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Do you see the similarity? His one and only son. Isaac Abraham, your one and only son. Why the one and only son? He is the son of promise. This is the distinction. Now, as I was reading this passage, and just kind of considering this, when when Isaac questions Abraham, where is the lamb? And Abraham says, God himself will provide the lamb. As you know, as we continue on the story, God doesn't provide a lamb at the end of this story. God provides a ram in the thicket. And I wondered, what? Why? God could have provided anything. (laughs) He could have put any, I mean, he could have put a cow somewhere. He could have put any kind of animal, but he provided a ram in the thicket. Was it just by chance that it was the natural species that would have been in the area? Is that what it is? But I want you just to see one more thing about this. We see the promised son of Yeshua, not just as the lamb that would suffer and take the sins of the world, but Isaiah in verse 9 says this about him, in verse 9, chapter 6, or chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For a child would be born to us, a son will be given to us, And the government will rest on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion, his dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. So the promised son was not only promised as the lamb that would take away the sin of the world, he was also promised as a ruler. And this is what's interesting. The word that Abraham and Isaac use for lamb is say in Hebrew. Lamb. The word for ram of what God provides in the Hebrew, ayil. And it's described as it's, it's a male sheep, generally more aggressive and protective and valuable to the flock. But in the Old Testament, in three, four other places, the same exact word can be defined as a leader, ruler, one who governs as a figurative extension of a ram as the leader of a flock. So the thing that God provides in place 
of Isaac is a ram. So he's not just the son that will come, but he is the son that will come to rule and reign. Amen? Amazing. It's interesting to note, and Derek, you'll know this, on Rosh Hashanah, when they blow the trumpets, in rabbinical tradition, they can, make, they can make shofars out of a few different animals. But on Rosh Hashanah, they can only use the horn of one animal, a ram. They can only use a ram's horn on Rosh Hashanah when they blow the sound of the trumpet. And the shofar is blown to remind them of the sacrifice Ram, the ram that Abraham sacrificed on Mount Moriah. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? That even in this, even in the traditions, we see Yeshua, we see his life, the ram. So let's ask a few questions more about this person of Isaac. So as I was looking at this, I said, well, how old, this is a common question, how old was Isaac at this? Well, let me, let me point out a few things that scholars tell us, and we can see. Isaac was at least old enough to know the proper sacrificial process, and he perceived it enough to ask his dad. He said, where's the lamb? So he's old enough to at least understand that. He's not a, a five-year-old. Well, maybe he was, but we know that Isaac was at least weaned. We also know that Sarah died at the age of 127, sometime after this account in Genesis 22. So this means it puts Isaac between the age of Five and 36, 37. He's got to be somewhere in that range. We also know that, again, we said the distance of the journey was three days. So he had to at least been strong enough to care for himself and to help his almost 100-year-old father <laughs> on a three-day journey. And if you've walked around this city, a three-day journey in this landscape, that's not easy. So he had to have been old enough for that. Also in Genesis 22, verse 5, the servants that accompanied Abraham are called young men. And it's interesting to note that the same Hebrew word that's translated as young men is applied to Isaac in verse 5 and verse 12. So even in the context of the Hebrew descriptor, it's, it's giving an idea that he was a young man. And probably the most compelling information is this, that as they climb the mountain, Isaac is carrying a large pile of wood. He had to have been strong enough to carry enough wood for the burnt offering. That's a lot of wood. So he had to have been at least strong enough to do that. Which a lot of scholars, through summarizing all these things, they believe he was around the age of 30, roughly. Between teenager and 30. But a lot of them believe he was around the age of 30. And it's interesting to note two things in correlation to this and the person of Yeshua. Yeshua began his public ministry at the age of 30. Yeshua went to the cross probably about the age 33. So there's a correlation there. Isaac carried his own wood up the hill. Yeshua carried his own cross to the hill of Golgotha. But here again, we see, we see similarities. We see connections between these two people. Another question Okay, if Isaac is indeed older, and he's, let's say, either a teenager or even into his 30s, why didn't he struggle with Abraham? In verse 9, it says, when they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. Why didn't, if he's... A 30-year-old man. You mean to tell me he just said, okay, Dad, tie your hands and lay on the wood and you see the knife coming. I mean, that is amazing to me in this context. Why didn't he struggle? And we'll hopefully get to that in a second. But I want to mark a similarity in Yeshua from Isaiah 53, verse 7 again. We read this, a, a portion of this earlier. He was oppressed and afflicted, he, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, and who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. Wow. 
They made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man at his death, although he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Remember, this is Isaiah. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a restitution offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. He will see it out of his anguish, and he will be satisfied with his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as spoil. Listen to this. Because he submitted himself to death and was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. We don't have a lot of account of what happened with Isaac, but we know that he willingly, there's, there's no way that Abraham, unless he knocked him out cold, I don't know there's, there's a way that Abraham could have subdued him, but that's not carried into the story. But what we, what we can take away from this is it appears that Isaac willingly allows Abraham to bind him, to put him on the wood. And we see our own Savior willingly, as prophesied, by the prophet Isaiah, giving himself. It didn't mean that he didn't struggle with it as a human being. It didn't mean that Isaac didn't struggle with it as a human being. But in the end, he surrendered. And listen to this. In Matthew 26, this is the account. is Yeshua goes to the garden on the night that he's, he's arrested. And it says in verse 39 of Matthew 26, going a little farther, he fell down face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And that song we sang earlier, it would be my, it is my joy to say your will. It's joy, but it's not easy. It's our joy, it's our privilege, but it's not easy. Even Yeshua in this context continues in verse 40, he comes to his disciples and he says, How, so you couldn't stay awake with me for one hour and pray? And then in verse 42, and again a second time, he went away and he prayed, Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Doesn't mean it wasn't hard. But in the end, he said, okay, I willingly submit myself to your will and your purpose for my life. Now, what really, really struck me, and this is going to bring us home on this message, what really, really struck me about this and this story and this passage is this is contrary to something that is very common in us, in, in human beings and even in animals. It's called self-preservation, okay? We have an instinct to us, in us to survive. This is what happens when someone is threatened for their life and they feel like they're going to die, so they would reach out and take someone else's life to preserve their own life. This is why in times of famine, people will hoard food or they'll hoard possessions. There's an instinct in us. There's an instinct even in the animal world. And, and science has seen this. And let me read this to you. It says, the instinct that is in us as humans also exists in the animal world. It is fight or flight it has been looked at by researchers and is driven by the body's production of adrenaline in stressful situations. Our body actually pumps us up to, to react, to uh, think about it. If we didn't have it and that we didn't have this, self, this uh, self-preservation, we would all do really, really dumb things. We'd all probably just walk off bridges. There would be no fear. It, there, there would be nothing that would cause us to, to back away from dangerous things. So it's actually a productive part of who we are and a productive part of it. keeps us from doing really, really dumb things. The other person that it's interesting that you see the life that this doesn't apply to is David. Trust me, if you're into self-preservation, you don't march out in front of a giant. You, you don't. All of the rest of Israel was in self-preservation mode. <laughs> they were thinking, I ain't going. I ain't going to do it. They were allowing that instinct to be very real to them. But David, you don't see it in his life. He believes, who, who are we to allow this giant to defy God? God will preserve me. Amen. And David marches out. You don't see it in his life. 
But this instinct is very real, and it's very much a part of it. And that's, that's what's interesting to me, is you don't see this instinct in the character of Isaac, and you don't see it in the character of Yeshua. It didn't mean they didn't struggle with it, but you don't see it that it overwhelms them. It doesn't overtake them. Why is that? Here's why I believe it. The same reason David believed what he believed. Isaac and Yeshua knew that regardless, God could raise them from the dead. Abraham believed regardless what happened. And how do we know that? It says it to us in Hebrews chapter 11. Let's read this together. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises, and he was offering his unique or promised son, the one it had been said about, your seed will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able to even to raise someone from the dead, and as an illustration, he received him back. Abraham knew that even if he followed through, for God's promise to him, for him to be his, his descendants through that seed, to be as fruitful as the, to, to be as numerous as the stars, that God would have to raise Isaac from the dead. Yeshua knew that God would raise him from the dead. It wasn't a question. Yeshua even said this in John chapter 8. He's having an argument with some people and they accuse him of being possessed by a demon and he says to them, your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. There's a hint here that Abraham not only saw the promised fulfillment of Isaac, that God would raise Isaac from the dead, but Abraham even saw the fulfillment of Yeshua, his death, his resurrection, and his reigning. And he rejoiced. And he believed in that. He believed God for that. In John chapter 17, in the prayers that John records of Yeshua as he's again praying before he's arrested. In John chapter 17, verse 4, he says, I have glorified, this is Yeshua speaking, he says, I have glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. Yeshua knew where he had come from. And he knew something that I believe, again, Isaac and Abraham knew. That if he were to try and take matters into his own hands, it wouldn't turn out well. If he had allowed himself to be taken in by his instincts to preserve himself, it wouldn't have turned out well. But he knew that if he submitted himself to the person of God, God is the only one that can preserve him. He can't preserve himself. No person, no thing could preserve him. Only God. There is a revelation in a moment that, guess what? There is only one thing that can preserve your life, and it's not you. It's God. There's only one thing. It doesn't matter what we try to do. It doesn't matter what we want to do. It doesn't matter what our instincts would tell us. There is only one thing. Thing, and that is God that can preserve my life, your life, and in this context, the life of Isaac. And they believed that. And they knew that God would be faithful to his promise. I'm going to summarize in, in before we come to a close. We said both Isaac and Yeshua were sons of promise. And we should rejoice and be glad about that. The promise one has come, and that is a reason for us to be excited. Amen? He has come. Again, even Abraham, as Yeshua said, was rejoiced at knowing that the day of his coming would, would come. So we should be excited about that. Both of these individuals offered themselves without struggle. They realized that only God could preserve their lives. And in fact, Yeshua presents a challenge in Matthew chapter 10. Listen to this. 
He said this, the person who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone finding his life will lose it, and anyone losing his life because of me will find it. Now, that's not teaching us that we shouldn't love our son or daughter. But what it's bringing us to the realization is, there again, there is only one person that can preserve your life. If I put my trust or hope in one of these other things, it will not turn out well. Because only God, only Yeshua, if I surrender my life to him, will I receive my life actually back. Amen? Now, in context, to the, in, in relation to the test, as I was reading the passages, and I thought, God, why? Why did you go through this process with Abraham? What was this really about? Was it, was it really just symbolism going forward, that it was symbolism that you wanted to show what was coming through the person of Yeshua, that you wanted? Was, was there a purpose in this test? And what I felt like God said to me was, in this test with Abraham, and even in the context with Isaac and Yeshua, God was not after the thing placed on the altar. Let me say that again. God was not after the thing placed on the altar. He was after the heart of the one placing it on the altar. Abraham had received in some way his promise. He had Isaac. That was the son. Abraham could have gone back to Beersheba and said, okay, I'm good, God. You gave me my son. Everything's going to work out. Great. Wonderful. I don't need to go sacrifice him. Just everything. We're good because now I can see everything's going to play out. And that promised thing actually could have taken a place in the heart of Abraham that actually only God should be in. His attachment to the thing that was promised could have actually separated him from the God who gave him the promise to begin with. What God was after was not the thing on the altar, but the heart of the person that was placing it on the altar. God wasn't after Yeshua's life when he asked him to go to the cross. But it was the heart of Yeshua to submit himself, knowing that his father As Pastor Mike said earlier, his father is faithful. He will return me to that place that I came from, and I know it, that I don't need to be afraid. I don't need to worry about that because my God is faithful, and I know who I am in him. So I want to close with a couple questions tonight. First one. Is there something in my life that God has asked me to lay sacrificially on the altar of faith? That's a big question. This doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Isaac was not a bad thing. He was the promised son. But God asked him to lay him sacrificially on the altar. That's big. Is there something in my life, God, that has taken a place... And I've begun to put my trust or my hope in that thing, and I have started to take my hope and my trust away from you. If that thing is in your life, you're beginning to take things into your own hands. You need to come back and realize only God can preserve your life. Only God can fulfill the promises that he gives you for your life. You can't do it in your own strength. Second question, what areas of my life am I struggling to preserve in my own strength? Am I holding something and I am fighting tooth and nail to keep it alive? And God is saying, let it go. Let it go because your fighting is taking you away from me. Trust me with it. Put it on the altar. Finally, how can I begin to release these things to Yeshua and find peace in this and knowing that it is only God who can preserve my life? And that's my prayer tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We have prayer ministry team tonight. 
The worship team's going to come and they're going to sing a song. And I want you just to think through those three questions. And if any of them tonight have just connected with you and you feel God speaking to you, there'll be people down here that are willing to pray with you into those things to ask God. But I'm going to pray collectively tonight. That as we just absorb this word, that we, we can see clearly. There are so many things, I think, in life that are difficult for us to see in our own lives. It's easy sometimes to spot in others, but it takes a lot of times the Holy Spirit or God working through others to, to help us see these things. So tonight, Father, we come to you. Lord, it is our desire to offer our lives, to offer those things that you promised to us back to you, that they would not become things that we would try to hold in our own strength and that we would try to preserve in our own strength, but things that we would trust you with because we know that it is only you that can preserve us and preserve our lives. And Father, tonight as we, we just consider these things, as we pray into these things in the coming week, God, again, give us clarity. Holy Spirit, speak into our hearts. Help us to see these things because we know that ultimately the road that that will lead us to will draw us away from you. And that's not where we want to be. But we want to be drawn closer in relationship and fellowship with you. So tonight, Holy Spirit, again, I just ask in this place, would you speak? Would you speak with clarity? Would you help us to see those things? Would you help us to surrender those things in our lives to you? And as Pastor Mike prayed earlier, for those that are struggling with believing that they can trust you, Father, I pray tonight that they just might sense you in a way that they'd never sensed you before in their lives. That they might come to that realization that whatever they have put their hope or whatever they have put their trust in, those things inevitably will fail, but you will never fail. You will never fail. And I pray these things tonight in the mighty name of Yeshua.